Hey, Randy and Chris, we're recording just so you guys know. Hey, Ben, how are you? I think you're muted. Steve, can you click on uh, gallery view? Sure. How's that? Works fine for me. So ben, I was telling Chris, I know you guys are super swamped and busy, but we really appreciate you guys being here a second time. <laughs> Okay, we'll go ahead and start in about a minute. See a few people still logging on. And just as for all, all you guys can hear me, we're gonna, this meeting will only go till seven o'clock. Okay, it's six o'clock. I will go ahead and get started, so not to waste any more time. Um, thank you guys all for joining this evening. My name is Steve Johnson. I'm the Studio City uh, Homeless Committee Chair, and also joining me is our uh, the president of the uh, board, uh, Randy Freed, as well as our public safety chair, Rachel Tobias. I think she's on. I'm not sure. So uh, Rachel's going to help me uh, with moderation, keeping me on schedule. Uh, because as I said earlier, we only this call will only go till about seven o'clock. Okay, so not a lot of time. So we, we've asked Ben Bessley, the Vice President of Development for Midwood Investments. He's also the owner of Sportsman's Lodge and Chris Freed, who's the Chief Program uh, Officer at LA Family Housing. She's in charge of the uh, project room key at Sportsman's Lodge. Uh, both of them, you guys, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for your participation. Um, the format of tonight's meeting is a conversation about the impact of Project Roomkeep at its current location in Studio City, which is Sportsman's Lodge. So this is our second town hall with Chris and Ben. And, um, you know, they've been so awesome to, uh, you know, grace us with their time again, a second time. And before we start this town hall, um, just wanted you guys to know that um, we fielded quite a few uh, questions from our stakeholders, people from Studio City, and uh, they submitted them to us. 
So we pre-selected some questions for you to answer, which I'll moderate here in a second. So part one, part one of, of, of this will be me, answer, me asking you those questions. And then part two, we'll have about 25 minutes for um, anybody, any participant on the call to ask questions of Chris and Ben. Um, just want to tell you that this is uh, a forum specifically about Project Room, room Key, and it's not a, a broad, uh, all-encompassing discussion about homelessness. I know there are a lot of issues around uh, the property, uh, the occupants, but specifically, if you could keep your, your, uh, your focus and your questions to Project Room Key, uh, Sportsman's Lodge, will be much appreciated. Um, let's see. And um, I wanted to also say that right after this meeting, starting at 7.30, we're gonna have our homelessness uh, committee meeting, the monthly meeting. So a lot of the questions that Chris and Ben may not be able to field for you, please join us at 7.30 for that meeting. And Rachel, uh, with regard to public safety, is there any, any upcoming meetings that you wanted to promote before I uh, go ahead and start? You're on mute. Okay, <laughs> she's having some technical difficulties. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and start, and Chris, I'm gonna start with you. I know the last time uh, that you were here with us, you talked about uh, the occupants uh, that are housed at Sportsman's Lodge uh, violating rules and being asked to leave. We had a question from a stakeholder, how many, how many uh, occupants have you asked to leave since its inception? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there was a button. Somebody locked me up from oh, yeah. being able to speak. Sorry, can you repeat the question, Steve? Yes, yes. So, Chris, the last time you were with us a couple of months ago, we talked about uh, the process that you have with, in terms of people violating rules on the property. A question that came, came uh, up from a stakeholder, how many people have you asked to leave the property? And part two, if they have been removed, uh, are they given a location to go to or are they just simply released on the street? So I think we've exited a total of four. None of them have been exited to the street. Um, all have been exited to one of our other PRK sites. So, um, and I think one actually went to our bridge housing site. I think there have been a, a couple of people that may have um, self exited, but we've only asked for to leave based on behavior. Okay. And next question with regard to LAPD and the fire department responding to the property. We have, this, this was a quite, a quite a big question here that I'm about to ask you, but there are, our residents are in that area, so there's been a, they seem to be an increase in terms of fire response, law enforcement response to the property. A lot of people talking about um, helicopters flying overhead at night. Have you seen any, an uptick in any type of crime or health issues at the property? I think in, with regard to increased um, paramedic and or increased uh, law enforcement, you know, you're, instead of the folks being kind of scattered throughout in different parts of Studio City, now they're all kind of congregated in one site. Um, and so we do have people, remember this is a COVID positive site, and as such we have people that are highly vulnerable, many of them are, are elderly um, and just more sick, sickly, I guess, in nature is probably the best way to describe it. And so, yeah, we, we have quite a bit of um, fire department response to the site, um, but primarily around health, uh, all around health related issues. Some of those um, um, have been mitigated because we've been able to bring on a health clinic that's doing mobile um, medical services, I believe it's twice a week, uh, but some, some of the folks just get ill and um, they call 911 and that's something that they can call on their own. They don't necessarily engage with um, LA Family Housing staff to help. The other, the other piece in terms of, of an uptick in LAPD, um, I haven't been there in the last week and a half, but 
but my staff tell me all the different incidents that kind of happen on site. And I don't really think that there's, over the course of the time, there hasn't been an uptick. I know that we had one particular incident that did create, um, it wasn't us that created it, um, LAPD called for backup and for whatever reason they called the cop drought. So there's been one incident with that on site, but it was with a person that was severely mentally ill, nothing um, criminal about the the act in nature we were trying to have the 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 individual placed on a on a psychiatric on a psychiatric hold. okay thank you the uh with regard to target date and exit date has one been set with sportsman side ben did you want to answer that you want me to answer that he's muted So, Rachel, do you know, uh, are you able to unmute? You and I may not be working from the same information, so I'll, I'll be happy to tell you what I've heard, and then you can tell me if you've heard the same thing. So, um, our original contract would take us through November 18, no, something around mid-November. Um, and then we, would, we were intending to extend it at least through mid-December. That was our intent. Um, we have had some conversations and some emails with um, some people at the city of Los Angeles General Services Administration with whom we negotiated the occupancy agreement and there they may be um, ramping the program down to end by the end of November um, but I haven't heard anything definitive about that that's just what I've heard and we so we've have, have you date. oh sorry We've actually received the date of November 18th and have been receiving phone calls from LASA in terms of the demobilization. Um, we've reached out to confirm if, the, if that date is a um, solid date or if there's any room for, uh, for pushing that out. But to, to our knowledge right now, we're, we're operating with the thought in mind that November 18th is the date that it will be closed. Okay, so would it be correct that, Ben, you haven't signed a renewal of that agreement? As, as of yet, is that correct? Correct. So with regard to, I know I've, I've uh, since, since my appointment, I've attended so much training, but one of the things that I attended was uh, how Project Room Key downsizes. And I was told that it takes roughly, I believe it was five or six weeks or so. So with November 18th, that's about five weeks, I think about four or five weeks away maybe, have you started the process of, of downsizing? So the way that it basically works is that once we get a, a, mobiliz a demobilization date, that, that doesn't necessarily mean we start downsizing. Uh, we're actually um, don't look at the potential of downsizing until two weeks out. So if somebody, if we're able to move someone into housing uh, between now and November, I think it's around November 5th or 6th, I think was our date. Um, we'll continue to bring people in with the thought of the last two weeks really focused on um, moving folks out. We do have um, plans in terms of how we're going to move folks out, where they're going. Um, a part of that will be into other PRK sites uh, that are still open. Some of the folks are moving into permanent supportive housing. Some are moving into market rate housing of the folks that we have in there right now. And others, um, we will be working with um, our other shelter sites. Uh, we have some open beds right now that aren't necessarily being quote held, but um, the timing actually just kind of fits right in terms of when those sites will reopen. Some of them have been on um, outbreak mode and an outbreak in a congregate site is typically just one person. So those sites are scheduled, if all goes well, to come off roughly around the same time as we start to truly demobilize um, everyone off site. Additionally, we're working with other motels right now to secure hotel rooms for those that we're not able to secure permanent housing for. So the goal is no one goes right back. Uh, nobody goes back to the street and definitely nobody gets left behind. So with regard to the November 18th date, I just want to just go back a little bit. As of now, there hasn't been a demobilization effort. You haven't started that. We have started the demobilization effort, but the demobilization effort is uh, working alongside of LASA at identifying all the folks that we have in there okay. and where we, where we intend on um, 
and how we intend on moving the folks that are currently in there into other forms of housing, whether that be permanent or other forms of interim housing. So we're having mm -hmm. calls twice a week right now with loss of staff. Okay, and you said the process, you said two weeks out from November 18th. That would, that's would when that we stop out? taking, that's when we stop taking new people in. Okay, so you're currently taking in more people. There yeah. was a rumor, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. That was it, just yes. There's a, there's a rumor with regard to the property and either of you feel free to answer this that, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. So of the 148 rooms there that, that are utilized, there is uh, thoughts of potentially 40 more rooms opening up. Is that correct? Has that happened? Uh, no, that has not happened. Okay, so it's still at the 148 number? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks for clarifying uh, that, that uh, factor. Because you know, as the community, and please, please uh, know that as we're fielding these questions, these are people that live next to the property, across the street, behind it. So there are some concerns uh, from, from, our, from every spectrum. Um, a lot of concerns. The next question I'm about to ask you comes from a, a person who's fairly active with it. Her concern is about kind of like the, hum the humane exiting of people from the property. So with regard to that, um, if somebody is, are, do you have instances where people are not moved on the last week or the last day? And, and, and are, are released just out onto the street. Does that ever happen at your other properties? So the, uh, Sportsman will be our first um, site that we're demobilizing. Um, but from my experience of what has happened at other sites, no one's been left behind. So LASA ensures that there's a plan, from my understanding, that there's a plan for everyone that's there. And uh, on the demobilization calls, they're very clear about um, going through one by one every week, uh, twice a week every name of every participant that we have to ensure that there is a plan that we're moving forward. Now, people may choose not to follow through with that plan and go back um, to wherever um, they feel the most comfortable. But again, most if, if the folks were not from that direct area, meaning on Ventura and more specifically Ventura and um, Laurel, that the likelihood of them just pitching a tent right there is is not likely people go back to to where they're most comfortable and um, from you know where they have friends or um other more community kind of connection so i don't think if i remember correctly when we were when we were doing a lot of the drive-bys and setting up sportsmen there was nobody on the corner of of laurel and um uh, ventura and i don't i don't think that that would be the case when we close down uh, Chris, if and, I could follow up with that, sorry, sorry, Steve. So the the twenty percent that LA Times reported that are um, are back out on the street, that's from choice, not from yes lack of housing. Okay. Yeah, through the CARES money, there's been plenty of money to to ensure uh, other movement, but sometimes the participants don't want to go. So okay. And then um, the perfect segue. Uh, I wanted to clarify something. This this also came up quite a bit when we talked to our stakeholders. So in, your, in the last town hall, you stated that um, most of the occupants at the property are from Studio City, but then you also later stated Studio City area. So can you clarify that for the community? Because people weren't sure if you meant like Sherman Oaks Valley area, Studio City, or actual Studio City. So I, re I mean, the only way I can clarify that is I received from Ben a list of uh, encampments that were um, of direct, uh, the, the encampments in Studio City, I'm assuming they were all from inside of Studio City or the uh, maybe border to Studio City. I'm not exactly sure, but the, the, the encampments that seem to create the most amount of complaint. And those are the encampments that we um, went to uh, to bring people indoor from Studio City. There were uh, some folks that came in from uh, some of the surrounding areas because we were only allowed to bring in at LA Family Housing, our, our target was there was 148 rooms. Uh, we were only supposed to bring in half of those rooms. We ended up bringing in more than three quarters of those rooms directly from, from the encampments that um, I received from um, the sheet that Ben had sent to me. The rest came from LASA, what they call LASA call center. 
And losses call center is also pretty specific about trying to make sure that people are coming from the community into the site. But I don't have the numbers of exactly where those folks are from. I just know that they're from the area. And, and, and we really appreciate the clarification because, um, you know, I, you, you know, potentially it was just misstated, but so to clarify the area, not, there's no data up that they are from. The I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't have losses data okay. from, okay, from, the, sure. from the rooms that they took. Okay. Here's, here's a question that I know the answer to from my last one, but a lot of people are asking us as a committee. So I, I see a guy on the corner of uh, walk and don't walk, whatever. He's a 25 year old white male. Why can he go into he looks pretty healthy. He just looks like he, he um, is out in the area. Is he allowed to just check into the property? No. Okay, can you just elaborate? Yeah, so, so first of all, remember that PRK sites are for people that are COVID vulnerable. So there's an assessment at what they call a tier one assessment that has to be done in advance um, before anyone uh, can be referred in. It is a refer in program. It is not a walk up program which means that people can't just, even if people show up just at the, at the front door of the hotel and say, um, you know, I heard about this program, I think I'm eligible, I think I'm even COVID uh, vulnerable, we, we could potentially do an assessment on them, but it's not a walk-up program. So they don't just, they can't just walk up to come in. Once we were completely filled, all of the referrals came through the LASA um, channel and we were able to to do some of the back referrals in meaning that other folks that we've been trying to engage in those same encampments that I talked about earlier those are folks that we continue to try to engage with and as we got uh, them from a no to a yes we are putting those referrals back into losses system so the beds there's there's plenty of people already on a waiting list to come into the multiple different PRK sites um, and um, I think probably the only time we would ever make an exception on a walk-up is someone so severely ill um, that if there was a room, which typically almost always there, there isn't, but if there was one that we would do a back referral, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll make it into that site. We would probably refer them to another site. We try to really, really discourage anybody from walking up or telling their friends to walk up at these sites. And then uh, with regard to COVID, just, just clarifying that this is not a COVID uh, facility, is that correct? It is not a COVID positive facility. It is a facility where we try to house folks that are COVID vulnerable, meaning that if they were to, con um, to contract COVID-19, that, that they're more likely um, to have severe reaction to COVID. Do you do that. testing at the site? Sorry? Do you do testing at the site? Uh, we do not do regular testing at the site. The only time there's ever regular testing that happens at a site is if there's an outbreak. And so far, we've had zero positive cases at, um, at, at uh, Sportsman. Okay. Last question, and I'm going to uh, pick on Ben here. So with regard to uh, the resources at the actual site, you know, such as mental health services, AA meetings, things like, you know, chemical dependency. Um, I know when I went there a few weeks ago, so I saw quite a few people uh, lined up at tables, like maybe six or seven stations. Can you tell us like what, what services are available for the people that are housed there? And, and, and you said the question? That was for me, yes? Yeah. For, for, I you said for Ben, I'm sorry, I thought you said for Ben. Okay. So um, when you came, I'm guessing that we had our housing fair. So we have a housing fair that's happening pretty regularly on site. We have our employment staff also on site. Uh, we have a medical clinic that comes on site. We have a legal team that comes on site. But I would say that the one that gets the absolute most um, uh, traction is the housing fair. We have our housing location team that comes on site. So we have units that are available. We bring a whole host of cars um, to be able to, to transport the participants to go look at units that are available um, and that we have um, negotiated out with um, landlords to hold on to why we're trying to connect the right people to. So um, we have a, a host of navigators uh, that particular day that's happening every week. Um, but, um, and that will increase to two times a week now that we're going through demobilization to ensure that anybody that wants to look at a potential um, permanent housing option that we're connecting the people at um, Sportsman first because it's uh, in terms of demobilization, it's, it's the soonest to close. Thank you. And I'm going to switch over to, to Ben uh, for a bit here. So um, Ben, did you want to kind of open up with anything, any kind of opening statement about, about uh, your perspective as a developer investor? Sure. Um, 
you know, I, first of all, uh, thanks to both to you and Rachel for hosting this. Um, I, I, I don't know how many people are, are joined in the town hall, I guess I could, oh, 42. So we've got a pretty big audience. Um, and thank you very much for kind of pulling these questions together so we can answer them um, and get as much information out as possible. You know, from the owner investor perspective, um, this program has gone about as well as we could hope. Um, and, you know, I think we, we certainly um, have seen, you know, a, a handful of incidents that I think represent, you know, some of the, some of the toughest, uh, you know, circumstances that people are in. Um, and at the same time, we've actually seen some, some pretty inspiring, uh, you know, people come, come and, and leave, actually move on to more permanent housing, which, is, um, which has been great. So, um, you know, I think that if, uh, if the program does end up ramping down sooner, meaning like by the end of November, I think it will, uh, you know, will do whatever, whatever the city um, and LASA require. Um, but I think that it, it would be um, disappointing for us primarily because, you know, this has been a big effort on, on, the, on the corporate side to understand how this program works. Um, from the operational side to bring, you know, a good amount of our staff back um, and, and they would obviously have to go back to not having jobs. And, uh, and, and that now that it's up and running, you know, again, it's not without incident, but I, I feel like at least from, from my perspective and from the perspective of, you know, the, the reports we get from our, our, from Securitas and other folks is that um, it is stabilized to some degree. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's probably the most I can say at this point. Thank you. So a couple couple specific questions. Let's see. It was reported uh, that your firm receives roughly half a million dollars per month, uh, funneled through the CARE Act, the city and the, and the, uh, the state, uh, county government. You know, you get that those funds. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna grill you on your 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 balance sheet, but I do want to ask you with regard to uh, additional security, have you invested in that? I know from our last call, there were, um, I think we, when, we, when we did our walkthrough, we counted about eight security guards, and this was like four o'clock in the afternoon, which I thought seemed pretty adequate since most of the activity is in the daytime. But have you upgraded that since that time? Uh, we have upgraded it to the degree that we have hired, uh, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this when we spoke First, but I know I've had subsequent conversations with um, neighborhood council organizations and um, uh, the business district folks. Uh, we we supplemented or sort of added on to the business district's uh, contract with Securitas for bike patrol. So the bid has bike patrol that runs. I, I I'm not even sure how many hours a day, whether it's eight or twelve or something like that. So we actually added an additional. Um, eight hour shift. Um, so that person and, and, and the bid also relocated the station of the bike here to the property so that all of the, all of the um, uh, shifts begin here. So the bike is kept here and the phone chargers are kept here and everything. So, um, and, and that was our effort to try to understand, you know, we, we were starting to get a lot of reports of different incidents happening around the neighborhood up and down Ventura Boulevard and in some cases in some residential neighborhoods and trying to get a sense of how much of that, if any, was was from one of the clients here. And so the directive that we gave Securitas was to, you know, work closely with the staff, the LA Family Housing staff, and, you know, get w within the bounds of privacy, you know, get to know the residents and understand, you know, of the of the people that stay here, a vast majority of them never leave. A vast majority just stay in their room and watch television and get you know different treatments and such. Um, but for those that do go off, you know, start to understand where they're where they're going to, and if there were incidents that involve um, clients, that we would get some information back on that, so we could try to pass it back to LA Family Housing and, and do what we could. With regard to, um, and I know that things. I know that with you, you shared last time, this was a blessing in a sense because it enabled you to kind of sustain since you're not building, you know, you have uh, funds coming in. Of, of, of what you do get, um, 
would you be willing to invest in a patrol patrol response, such like a vehicle response? Um, is this a question by a particular yes. person? Yes. Uh, no, the answer is no. Uh, because uh, a question was submitted that a cost for the next few few weeks or less cost to hire a private patrol would cost a mere thirty thousand dollars. You would not be interested in investing in that. Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> the answer is no. And and you know I, I I have a strong feeling I know who submitted this question. Um, the, the the revenue figure you stated is not reported. This is not reported because it's supposed to be private information. So however, this information made it out was uh, probably uh, a violation of somebody's duty at work. And uh, if that person is ever you know, identified, I think that could be a real issue. Um, but for, the, for anybody who you know, understands the, how the program works financially, yeah, we're paid a rate every night for the person who stays here. It is 60% of what our normal rate would be. And we still staff this hotel and we still pay the utilities and we still pay the insurance and we got to keep the pool running. So, you know, you have to remember there's a cost side of this as well. There's a startup cost to it. There's a fencing cost to it. There's an additional security cost to it. So, you know, if, if, there's, a, if there's a sense that this is a windfall, uh, that's not at all true. Um, and we've, uh, we've done what we feel is appropriate to try to understand what the issues are. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I think having somebody in a patrol car might make some people feel better that, you know, if some incident happens that somehow a patrol car is going to number one, know that it's happening. Number two, you know, speed in that patrol car to do something. Sorry. That's my light. <laughs> Hold on a second. There we go. I stopped moving. Um, uh, but it, you know, it's, I, I, I think that it's, um, I don't know how effective that is other than giving people a sense of that security. And for, for that cost, it just doesn't seem necessary. So would I like to be able to spend a lot of money and make everybody feel comfortable? Of course I would, but I, number one, I don't know that I would ever feel if, 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 uh, everybody would feel totally comfortable. Number one, and number two, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, we're, we're trying to have a sense of proportional, proportionality to, you know, a, a response. So I think that's my answer. Ben, as of, um, from last meeting, you actually contradicted yourself. You said you would consider uh, a patrol service in the area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I spoke to uh, Ralph's across the street and they report incidences daily, if not several times a day. Um, and they've had a reduction in, in their income of 25%. Um, this is a, an issue, um, whether you want to take it seriously or not. Uh, I hope that you will reconsider that. Um, I, I appreciate the information. I've actually had direct communication with one of the senior folks at Kroger. Um, and I've heard that, I've heard that same thing, but we've not been contacted by Kroger about this. Um, I am not an expert in policing or security, um, so I'm not. You know, I don't. I don't know what to say other than, you know, would would somebody in a patrol car be better able to respond than somebody on a bicycle? Would they be more likely to actually have a, a conversation or contact with people? I don't know. Um, so I didn't. And I apologize if I, you know, if it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. Would I? Would we consider it? Sure, we, we would consider it, but instead we've spent the money with Securitas to enhance the bike patrol. Okay, at this point, um, we have about 25 minutes remaining. And so we're gonna open it up to the floor um, and reiterate to everybody that um, we have a limited time. So if, when, as Rachel calls on you for your question, if you could limit your dialogue to under two minutes and uh, Rachel, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Just get my uh, timer up. Um, I'm going to go with a, a Q and A from uh, the written Q and A uh, from anonymous attendee. I'm confused. First, it was stated that the people won't go back to. Rural underpass, they'll go back to where they are comfortable. 
Then it was stated that the people were from encampments from the area and were th three fourths of the population. More than what you were supposed to fill. Sorry, I'm trying to understand this. So with all the encampments now that they are building in your expertise opinion, when the housing closes, where are these people going to go? I think that's to you, Chris. Yeah. So uh, I'm confused. I'm a little bit confused by the question too. Uh, I read, I was trying to read them to stay a little bit proactive and stay ahead, but um, so I'm going to do my best to try to answer that um, to the way I understand it to be, which is, if people were from Laurel Canyon and the 101, let's say underpass, that's where we were. And we did move some of those folks into to our site. If that's where they want to go back to because they don't want to go to one of the other PRK sites or another hotel uh, or permanent housing that we're able to help secure. I mean, ultimately we're not the police, we can't make them. And so people, people have the freedom to be able to go back to where they want to go. Um, but we do have the options for them to go to these different sites. And um, fundamentally, I'm not a huge fan of um, putting people from one motel site per se into another motel site. I'm, I'm, I'm a much bigger fan of the permanent solution, which is finding housing that we can um, move them into their, their own space um, and work with them to stabilize them um, in that space, whether that be stabilizing them and increasing their benefits, whether that be connecting them to a longer term subsidy, whether that be connecting them to other form of, uh, of, of employment. Um, that, that for me is more ideal, but ultimately I think um, LASA, um, when they opened PRK and when I think even the governor had opened PRK, there was a commitment to the communities that, that the goal wasn't just to move folks inside for a short period of time and then open the door when this when the date came and push everybody out and say good luck. I think the goal all along has been to help um, the folks that we have inside secure something, either some other form of interim or something, obviously the 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 bigger goal of finding them permanent housing. So we're committed to that. We're committed to working through all of the folks that are in that site to getting them placed somewhere. But ultimately they are the ones that have to agree um, to those sites. It's unlikely that I'm gonna find another hotel um, along Ventura Boulevard um, or in, in that area or the a number of rooms that I need for any one group. I mean, ultimately we've had conversations too, I think with the council member's office and other folks to see how far back this could be pushed because you know, with the holidays coming up um, and with COVID, with the expectation of COVID to resurface it in even um, stronger, um, uh, even, uh, I guess, a greater wave, if you will, during the winter months it has been predicted. And so um, we're not looking to shorten the timeline, but ultimately we're living within the constraints that we have. And so if November 18th is a day, then that's the date that we're going to work toward getting everyone placed into some form of other interim and or permanent housing. There are dollars for that. Aiden asks, why aren't the security guards patrolling the adjacent river path? I think that's to you, Ben. Um, that's a good question. I actually had, had directed the folks at Securitas to, to make that um, part of their route. So if, if that, I'll, I'll confirm that, uh, they should be. Um, is there a, oh, Todd asks, is there a curfew for the residents staying in the hotel? How are they tracked? So PRK in and of itself does have a curfew. Um, but we know that with the population that we serve, if we are firm on a curfew, the reality is, is that they'll be out roaming the street. And so from our perspective, um, um, it doesn't make sense to do that. I'd rather have people sleep inside than stay outside and roaming the street. I think, but, but back to what Ben was saying, the vast majority of the people that we have indoors don't leave very often. There's some that do, but the vast majority, they're just happy to be inside in, air condition, in an air conditioned room with food kind of coming, cable TV, um, a bathroom to use, uh, and utilizing the services that we're bringing on site to try to get them um, more permanently placed. So um, there, are, there are some people, but ultimately a curfew um, all that would do was to shut them out and they'd be sitting out on the corner of Ventura and Laurel Canyon waiting for the morning. So it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open up to 
people with their hand raised. Uh, Scott Mandel, go ahead and unmute yourself. You have two uh, hi, everybody. Scott Mandel here. Uh, the topic of my question is transient registered sex offenders. The list from the California DOJ tells me there are dozens of transients, that's, those are their words, registered sex offenders in Studio City and in the surrounding area. The list also tells me who has registered Sportsman's Lodge as their address. So my question is, do you have a policy that encourages the transients who are registered sex offenders, if there are others at Sportsman's, to comply with the law and register their current address as Sportsman's? Thank you. Well, I think that anybody that has a sex of that, that that's convicted of a sex offense and is a required lifetime um, person to register, I think that that would be on them. I mean, we're not running people for that background, so I have no idea who that who those who those folks are. I, I'm I'm not sure as to the question. I, I think there's lots of house sex offenders also living in Studio City. I think if we were to pull that up, I don't I don't think that there's necessarily that big of a um, matter of fact I think there's more housed sex offenders and there are unhoused sex offenders in the area um, but we don't do background checks uh, and we're not a law enforcement agency but we do tell folks like if there's some if there's any type of legal help that they need or if there's anything that's going on it's always better to be more transparent and to do the things that they need to do to be able to get their life in order I mean obviously uh, the vast majority of people that came inside to these sites, they're looking for um, some level of help. They knew that that the agreement to coming indoors wasn't necessarily that they had to participate in case management, but that there was going to be an awful lot of people um, really working hard to to get them housed. And that that through that work, um, we needed to have a better understanding of who we were working with. So, again, we don't we don't do background checks. Um, but if they've if they've registered there, then I yeah I haven't looked, so I don't know. I apologize. Okay, um, caller number. I'm sorry, five starting with five six one, ending in seven one three. Hi, Miss um, Tobias. Miss Tobias. Yes, go ahead. I, I emailed a question um, from from um, Ruth. Did you get it or should I read it? Uh, go ahead and read it. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, just one second. Okay, so basically the gist of my question was that I'm in a house, I'm an unhoused person in Studio City and I live in the immediate area of the Sportsman's Lodge and I have lived here for a few years and I have medical problems that I thought would qualify me for the project room key. However, I was not able to get a room um, and I was rejected. And like they told me, I couldn't get a referral at this point because like they're all done, I guess. But um, my question is basically, um, is there going to be like a special enforcement cleaning zone when this thing ends or like some sort of in enhanced law enforcement or sanitation, because that would really further victimize people that weren't able to get assistance through the project room key and have been here for many years. I don't know that I understood that question if that was for me. Okay, what the question is, is like when there's a bridge house or in, project room keys in other parts of LA, there's special enforcement cleaning zones or enhanced law enforcement or both. So there's basically a lot of encampment sweeps, a lot of arrests and further displacement for the people who weren't able to get assistance through with the project room key or the bridge home that it's by. So I was wondering if there was any plans to implement something like that in November. That I don't know. What comes to the caller? What is your name? Ruth. Ruth. Um, Ruth, I'm really sorry to hear that you weren't able to qualify. And um, to answer your question, we have not heard of any sort of uh, enhanced sanitation or, or uh, law enforcement 
um, that would follow this program. And I, okay, hope, I hope that you don't, I hope that you don't give up trying to find some place to live. In the, in the okay. interim, Ruth, uh, if Rachel can provide, or Steve, if you can provide uh, Ruth with my contact information, um, uh, I can help facilitate placement, Ruth. Okay, thank you. I emailed the question. Are you able to respond to it with that information? I, I as of today, I did not receive it. Who forwarded it to me? It was late. It says roof, roofless Ruth at Gmail. Um, it's to R Tobias at Studio City Neighborhood Council, I think. At studiocitync.org. I'll, I'll look again. It might have gone to spam. I'm so sorry that I didn't see that earlier. It's okay. I sent it kind of late. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I have one from uh, Patrice Berlin. Hi there, how are you? Um, so I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, Ben, it was not me that asked that question about the patrol. You can verify that with Randy. And that contract was gotten legally by somebody other than myself, but it's a legal public document. So you're wrong about that. Um, secondly, so you're saying that you have, um, so there's more bike patrol. I've never seen one in the neighborhood. I've never seen one. But so you're saying that bid has increased their bike patrol. Does that mean they're paying for it or Sportsman's is paying for it? And then you said you've added one eight hour shift to the bike. So that means Sportsman's has added one eight hour shift, but they're not in our neighborhood. We've never seen any of this security in our neighborhood. And quite frankly, we're afraid to walk our streets now. Talk to anybody uh, in the immediate neighborhood. We won't go down Ventura Boulevard anymore. We won't go down in the river anymore. We won't go on cold water anymore because all of these new strangers are in our neighborhood. So, and one more thing, uh, you say the uh, fire department, et cetera. They, uh, I, I have information that the fire department is there three to five times every day because of this situation. And you're saying, well, it's COVID related people that are sick or whatever. But then on the other hand, you're saying nobody's got COVID there. So, so are you saying that there hasn't been any fights, no overdoses, no crime, no, uh, 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 nothing has happened like that. It's just people that got sick because that's not what I've heard. Ben, did you wanna start and then I'll finish with the, the last? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I, I don't have a specific response, Patrice, but I will, uh, and I, I'll have to let Chris answer the question about you know in, it, what the incidents are happening that are that are drawing the fire department here. Um, you know, I have I, I I don't spend as much time in this neighborhood as as you all do, um, but I do spend a fair amount. I'm here you know usually ten hours a day, um, and I was actually here the other night, uh, and I sent you a message about that because I walked up an Adventure Boulevard, um, drove over. Uh, when I heard that there was some some folks uh, on Ventura that that shouldn't have been so um, you know the the fact that that you or anybody doesn't feel safe walking down cold water uh, is terrible and I'm and I'm very sorry to hear that um, I I think that you know there are when, when we have programs such as this, you know, this was a difficult decision for Midwood to make to take on because it's, you know, it comes with a, a whole host of risks um, that we had, you know, we, we took a lot of comfort in the fact that we visited other locations. We talked to Chris. I happened to have, you know, several personal connections to Chris and to LA Family Housing. And so we had a great amount of faith that this organization could really do what they, what, what was described as they would do. Um, but nonetheless, you know, th this is the, the population by definition is they they are they're ch they have challenges and and occasionally that leads to you know medical issues. It, it leads to self harm. It leads to erratic behavior. Like when we can't help that, but there's no there's no way to help this population 
um, without starting and without trying. And so, you know, to the issue of security, um, we, we have enhanced it. Um, we, we pay for it. What we did is because we wanted to onboard it quickly and not go, you know, interview security companies and figure this stuff out. We said, look, the bid has a contract. We're just going to augment it. We're paying for it. We are paying for the additional time. So it does not come out of the bid. And by the way, the sportsman's lodge property is the third largest contributor to the bid every year. So we, we would pay for it one way or the other. Um, but I mean, I think it, I, I'll, I'll just close by saying, and I want to turn this over to Chris that, um, you know, a, a truly, I, I hear you, Patrice, and, and other folks that have concerns. I, I read every one of your emails. I read my security ports every single morning. Um, I, you know, there's no doubt that some of the activity that's happening in this neighborhood is, I, I, I don't know, it's anecdotal, but I, it would be hard to believe that it doesn't come from some of these clients. Um, but it is, it is something that we can manage to a certain degree, and the rest of it is, as I've said, it's about just hearing from, from you and from others and trying to respond to it as best we can. So I would say with regard to, uh, there has been zero cases, confirmed cases of, um, of anyone that's staying in um, the sportsman uh, uh, of a positive COVID test. Uh, we had someone that was about to enter that um, actually got uh, her test read. And so we were in process of facilitating her move in and, um, and then moved over to a QI site because it was more appropriate um, because she was positive. But to date, we haven't had anybody that's been inside. We've had several people tested or they've tested on their own. Um, and because the COVID is reported to the Department of Public Health, anytime that there's a potential or a positive case, we're, we're notified. And, and most of my other sites I've had, including our long-term sites, we've had um, di multiple different people at different times, um, not multiple people at the same time, but people that have come and go that have, have been positive, none at the sportsman. Um, but there are, uh, you know, when you're dealing with folks, primarily folks that are, um, if, if um, so the rule of homelessness is for the chronically homeless, so for folks that have been outside for a long period of time, 48 is their age limit. So for a senior status, for someone who's living outside, 48 is it. So for anyone on the phone who's 48, uh, imagine if you yourself had been living outside, the likelihood that you would see the age of 49 is not great. So when we get a bunch of folks that are 48 um, and through the 65 age, which is um, the, uh, the starting age theoretically for um, an automatic into a COVID uh, vulnerable site. Um, uh, I mean, these, these folks have a lot of issues. They've been outside for a long period of time. And so they have a lot of medical issues. Some of them um, don't necessarily need a 911 call, but because of the, um, the, problem with uh, entering a an emergency room right now um, in terms of getting a ride to an emergency room. So if they don't have a vehicle and they're not feeling well or something else is going on, um, it's, it's almost impossible to get a ride. So Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, uh, buses are not running as often. So Uber and Lyft, obviously, uh, they're pretty, they're pretty um, specific about who's getting in their car. Buses are not running at a regular rate. And um, our staff, we only have enough staff on site to actually be able to manage the site. And so it's not like we can come and go. So there is somewhat of an agreement or an understanding with the fire department that if we feel someone is severe enough or that needs to be looked at in a way that otherwise um, uh, they would go to the emergency room, the, the calls are being placed. Um, so you're saying none of these calls from the fire department are uh, criminally related? I, we haven't had any overdoses. The whole time. Nothing. Well, maybe Ben can. I, we haven't had any overdoses, to my knowledge, in five years that I can remember that I know of. Do you know of any Ben of no. actual overdose? No. I don't know any at at, at um, that site. Now, that's not to say that people that might that might uh, they might call for themselves because they think they're having a medical issue that might be related to drug usage. That's that's possible, but uh, actual overdoses. And to my knowledge, we haven't administered any Narcan on site. And I can verify that tomorrow with my staff um, and definitely report back to Rachel if I've misspoken. But I usually get the calls of the overdoses and I haven't heard of any at that particular site. We have had um, 
we have had people, I think Ben spoke to this and one, one of the things that I actually really appreciate, Ben, I don't know if I've said this before, one of the things I really appreciate is people that have worked in this field like me for a very, very long time, um, the compassion, understanding, empathy, um, we expect that. But for from most average folks we that, that don't work in this field, we don't expect that. And I appreciate the level of understanding that you come with and um, the, the patience that I think you exhibit. We have, we have a lot of folks inside that have severe mental health disorders. And so um, they're for sure, if, if we feel the need to call 911 to have somebody, um, to have somebody uh, potentially 5150 or put on a hold, we will call 911 um, because we want everyone on site to feel safe. Remember, it's not just the service provider that's on site. We have nursing staff that's on site. We have security staff that's on site. We have um, legal staff that are on our site. We want everyone to feel safe. So if there's someone that's exhibiting behaviors that we feel are too severe for, for even us, or they're not willing to engage with us and have a conversation with us, but being erratic, we're gonna call the proper authorities to make sure that the entire neighborhood is safe. And I mean, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe we've had three to five calls a day. I wouldn't be surprised to say we've had one on average per day. Um, there probably well, has that been. comes directly from the fire department. All right, Patrice, I got to meet you. So, I'm sorry. Uh, she had just said it becomes directly from the fire department. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have a, a multiple questions. Sure, I, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure, um, but I, I do know that on average, I, I would not be surprised for one a day because typically the the calls would have gone out to the encampments, but instead they're being concentrated in one site. Remember, we have about 200 people. Ben, is that right? About 200. 178 to 176 was the last number I heard. Just to um, time, I think, Rachel, please. we have time for one more question. I was just about to say that. Uh, Peter Cole had his hand up. Go ahead. Hi there. Peter? Peter? Can you hear me now? Yes. Hey there. Um, ben, a question or two for you. Question and a statement. So if Project Room Key um, gets funded and can come back in six to eight months or a year, how would you feel uh, once your um, project is fully up, all your stores and restaurants, if the Park Motel decided to do Project Room Key? Also, um, walking in the neighborhood, I walked in front of sportsmen's. I really don't understand how you can allow room key guests to hang out in the bushes in front of sportsmen's in the evening. It's really scary. Um, I spoke to another um, board member of the neighborhood council who told me that um, she used to walk up to the boulevard and she no longer does. I don't walk up there at night anymore. It's too scary. Are you at all concerned about the um, fallout from this and how long it's going to take for the community, the local neighborhood, to feel safe walking in the neighborhood to walk up to your project once it's complete? Thank you. Um, those are great questions, Peter. Um, you know, the, the first question is sort of a, a hypothetical about you know, if, if this project room key were to come back, uh, I don't know if we're talking about, you know, at this, at, at the Sportsman's Lodge Hotel or a hotel nearby, I think we would, uh, we would, we would evaluate it. Um, it was, we, it was at the Park Motel was the, was the question right down the street. Sure. Uh, no, we, we would, we would welcome it. But the community probably wouldn't feel safe if it's handled in the same way. So it could very, the, the point is, it could very well affect your future business. It, it could. So I'm, try, I'm trying to get you to understand our mindset, how, just how uncomfortable we have all become in our own backyards. I, I truly appreciate that, Peter. And, um, and, and again, you know, I, I've been here at night. I did. I did respond uh, last week and came out to the site and walked up and down Metro Boulevard. Um, frankly, I didn't feel terribly comfortable, but it wasn't. 
there was nobody there. It, it, it was more just being on a on an empty, dark sidewalk, you know, with without a whole lot of people around. Um, so I, you know, again, as I said earlier, I I don't spend as much time. Pardon. I don't I don't spend as much time here as obviously the people that live here do, but I do spend a good amount of time. Um, and you know, we, we will be uh, one thing to know about our firm is that you know we, we the the firm has. Um, had a financial interest in the hotel since it was originally built in 1962. Um, we have no plans to divest at all from the retail center when it's built. And so, yeah, we have, we have a very, oh, very strong vested interest. Um, is there somebody who's not muted who perhaps- Yeah, and I'm trying desperately to mute and it keeps unmuting. I'm sorry. That's okay. It sounds like somebody has a cough. Do you have control over it? Yeah, yeah that's- you. Anyhow, um, no, I, I, but I appreciate your point, Peter. I really do. And, um, you know, I, I think that, I think that, you know, beyond what, you know, what this, uh, the arrangement with Project Room Key, the occupancy agreement we have, the financial arrangement we have, you know, the obligations we have, you know, for the property, um, it, it is, uh, it, again, there, the issue of, I, I deal with it in my neighborhood in Los Feliz as well. I, I've got, I've, I've walk by people all the time um, that I'm pretty sure don't live in my neighborhood and I'm, I get concerned with, but, you know, I think that on balance, um, what this program does is pretty extraordinary. And um, I think, there, there are benefits to it that are not immediate, that are not, that aren't felt, you know, in the immediate neighborhood. Um, because ideally people start here and then they go elsewhere and that's where they can continue, you know, hopefully a better housing situation. So I know that doesn't give you much solace because that doesn't change, you know, the way you feel when you walk up and down cold water. Um, but I, I, I hear you and, and, I, and I've, you know, I've, I've felt the feeling myself here, both here and in my own neighborhood. Okay, um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. So Chris and Ben, um, these are tough questions, but we, uh, first and foremost, we really appreciate being upfront and honest about it because I think it only builds a better rapport with the community. And as has been mentioned, once this ends, I'm sure there'll be another phase to, um, it may not be our committees, but you may be working with other committees. So we appreciate you coming here. Um, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and close it out. Um, Randy, did you have any last minute stuff? No? Okay. So at 7.30, you guys, tonight, I know a lot of homeless issues came up around uh, the area. And please join us at 7.30 for the, tonight for the Homelessness Committee meeting. We have a lot that we want to talk about with, with the stakeholders. So we'll see you guys hopefully at 7.30. And Chris and uh, Ben, maybe you guys, maybe we'll, uh, if this goes, continues, would you guys be open to coming back maybe in December, January, possibly, if this continues? <laughs> okay, <laughs> kind of a half nod. <laughs> no, I'll, I mean, I, the answer for me is yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. thank and, you guys. And that's, and that's a commitment. <laughs> thank you for having us again. We appreciate it. I yeah, appreciate so it. This really is helpful. And, and Rachel, Steve, and Randy, thank you for organizing it and really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody. <laughs> have a great night. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Have a good night.